Um, I have the great honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Ibrahim Mayaki to us as our final closing keynote. Um, and I think I could go on about what he's done, but uh, funny story of last night's gala dinner. Isn't Dakuna here? Is he sitting with us? There he is. Uh, he was telling me, he was sitting next to him and uh, asked him what he does. And he only found out about 10, 15 minutes later that Dr. Mayaki was a former prime minister of Niger. <laughs> And it just shows the humility of, of a leader like Dr. Mayaki who can sit at a dinner with a student and just engage without um, even sharing all of the achievements. But because this is a formal event, I will have to quickly tell you what he has done. <laughs> um, he was the Prime Minister of Niger between 1997 and 2000. He founded the Public Policy Circle in August of 2000. Um, last year he was appointed Chairman of the Development Assistance Committee by uh, former Secretary Ban Ki-moon. And since 2009, so almost eight years now, he's been CEO of NEPAD, which is the um, economic development body or agency of the African Union that tries to really force regional integration. Um, and he will be speaking on that this evening. So without further ado, I, please uh, help me in welcoming Ibrahim Dr. Mayak. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Thank you, Biruk. And I, I would very sincerely like to thank the, the organizers for such a, a beautiful learning experience since yesterday night. Uh, I've learned a lot. And uh, I have had that singular uh, experience of sensing your energy. Because all of you are really full of energy. And this is a, a, a critical and uh, important uh, aspect of what Africa will become in the next 20 years. But at the same time, it's a big challenge to speak after Donald Kaberuka and right after uh, Magra Samachel. You know, so um, she was talking about lowering your expectations, but in my case, you need to lower the expectations <laughs> more. Huh? Okay, so I, uh, I'll try to um, focus my presentation on five, and if I have time, in six points. Uh, the first one is uh, how I look at Africa today. Uh, some of you who are studying economics must have read uh, the book of Olivier Blanchard, who was a former chief economist of the IMF and uh, who is now a, a professor of economics at MIT. So Olivier likes to say that when he goes to conferences on you know, economic development, etc., there are always two, uh, two different types of settings. In one setting, you have the IT gurus, the Silicon Valley guys, uh, talking about the Internet of Things, robotization, the clouds, etc. <laughs> and uh, in another setting, you have the economist saying that, well, uh, productivity growth in the developed world is very slow. Uh, the high unemployment rates are still there, and it will be difficult to reduce them in the next six to ten years. So you have these economists who are a bit pessimistic, and you have the IT gurus who are very optimistic, and they are describing the same world. So the same thing happens with Africa. Uh, when I go to conferences which are about uh, uh, African agricultural development, uh, uh, I will hear examples of a Malian farmer who has a solar panel which uh, produces energy for his cell phone, where he can look at applications on how to use fertilizers and better irrigate. And is um, uh, connected. And then uh, I will hear on another room a farmer's organization complaining about the fact that even though 
they spend, according to FAO, $100 billion in Africa's agriculture. They are still marginalized. They are not supported. And uh, they don't influence the policy design processes in agriculture transformation. And I will hear that, well, uh, we are importing for $50 billion of food. And uh, we have the uh, highest uh, uh, proportion of arable land in the world. So the glass is half full and half empty. So that uh, 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 definition of a continent is, is very important when we look at it under the prism of the policy design processes. We, are all, we have all been used to think that policy design processes are rational processes. And we have forgotten that a policy is the product of power relationships. And why am I making this point? Because Africa has a median age of 19. Europe has a median age of 47. You can't govern a society where the median age is 19 as a society where the median age is 47 because the nature of the power relationships is radically different. And this is why the impact of the youth in the policy design processes and implementation needs to happen now. In the next 10 years, 90% of the current leaders on the African continent will no longer be in power, mathematically. It's, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's too long to go. And then you will see emerging new leaders. 90% of these leaders will no longer be here, so they will be replaced by other leaders. And if you look at the pace of democratic intensification, the role of a civil society, the role of a private sector, the role of, of a farmers' organizations, etc. The leaders of tomorrow will emerge from that dynamics. And then they will shape new power relationships. So policies, uh, uh, inevitably, will have to change because the power relationships would have changed. So I, I would like you to just think a little bit about that because it opens enormous possibilities in uh, the, your potential capacity uh, to transform what uh, Africa is today and what uh, Ma uh, Grassa Machel uh, was uh, saying, you should reflect on the Africa you want. You know, we have a framework at the African Union because Nepal, as you were saying, is a development agency of the African Union. But we have a framework which is Agenda 2063. And that framework says the Africa we want because it was designed bottom up. But you need to reflect on the Africa you want. And the next 10 years are the moment where all these changes will take place. And these changes are taking place at the moment where all the paradigms are changing, you see, uh, the development paradigms. Uh, you know about a country which was looked at a success story by all the multilateral development banks, etc., all the international community. That country had the highest literacy, African country, highest literacy rate of girls. It had the highest penetration of IT. It had uh, good ports, good airports, I mean, good rails, uh, a sound agricultural production with export to Europe. That country was Tunisia. And Tunisia imploded. And when you think about uh, the implosion of Tunisia, you need to rethink about how you look at development. Because Tunisia was an exemplary model of development, and Tunisia failed. Tunisia failed for many reasons, but the fundamental reason is that the Tunisian youth didn't think that uh, they 
they rejected the model in which they were because of the governance systems. And remember, you cannot govern a society which has a median age of 19 as a society which has a median age of 47. So the, the impact of the youth on the implosion processes of Tunisia was, was real and effective amidst all these objectives that were attained in all these sectoral domains, from agriculture to transport to energy to IT, etc. Tunisia is a very important source of reflection when we think about development, because we shouldn't forget what governance is about. Second case, Mali. Uh, Mali was a stable country, and uh, uh, Mali had, you know, a, a, a very high level of democratic density, uh, and you know, the transition from one power to another were quite important. So we can say that Mali had sound governance systems, but Mali imploded. Why did Mali implode? Because Mali didn't define the right policies regarding the control of its territory. Mali didn't invest enough in education. Mali didn't do what Tunisia did, but Tunisia didn't do what Mali did, and Mali imploded. So you have a second example of, of, uh, of model which, which failed. So when you look at these two models, uh, uh, you draw certain conclusions. You, you draw a conclusion on the uh, definition of development, which is no longer the monopoly of a central state. And you draw a conclusion on governance, because the governance systems need to be much more bottom up, much more open. And the combination of the advantages that Tunisia had and Mali had gives you a sense of the possibilities of, uh, of development models. And today in the continent, you can roughly describe all our governance models in a spectrum that goes from Botswana to Central African Republic. Botswana and Central African Republic have almost the same size, roughly. They have the same density of natural resources, minerals, etc. They came at independence roughly at the same time, in the 60s. And when they came uh, uh, to independence, Botswana and Central African Republic had both of them uh, 40 hundred dollars of GDP per capita. Today, Botswana has a GDP per capita which has been multiplied by 20, and Central African Republic has a GDP per capita which has been divided by two, 8,200. These two countries are in the same continent, Africa. And uh, uh, He's showing me that I just have five minutes. So I don't have time to go into the details of how Botswana built itself and how uh, uh, Central African Republic deconstructed itself. But all the models that we currently have can fit within a spectrum that goes from Botswana to Central African Republic. What's the difference between the two? The difference between the two is that one was really based on extractive institutions. Huh? As, uh, well, you have read Deron Asomoglu, Danny Rodriguez, and so on. And extractive institutions. And Botswana was based on inclusive institutions, where bottom-up processes in policy design did exist, where spatial, the spatial dimension in public, in, in planning processes did exist where the uh, empowerment of local communities was important and the institutions were respected. Totally the contrary in the, in the Central African Republic. And today, in order to reconstruct the Central African Republic, it might take maybe 20 to 25 years. 20 to 25 years if the right leaders do not emerge. And uh, 
it allows me to touch that issue of, of, of leadership. Um, I have an admiration for the construction that Fred talked about and the, the, leadership, uh, the leadership academy. And the, what I sensed was that leadership was not you know, assimilated to high power individuals, but was a, a shared function uh, throughout the society. And that shared function throughout the society is what really will help construct adapted governance systems that will lead to the choice of development models that will be owned by, uh, uh, by, uh, by, by most of us. And uh, uh, I am 66 years old, by the way. <laughs> when, I, when I started working in 1975, my main preoccupation and motivation was to work for a government and work for the state, etc. And I was looking at my career in that perspective. You are not looking at your careers in that perspective. So the, the advantage you have, uh, the knowledge that you have accumulated, which I didn't have, uh, the capacity that you have to innovate is really what Africa needs today. So we did our time, as Grassa Machel was saying, as much as we could. But the triggering processes of a genuine development will come through your innovations. And that is what will allow us uh, to really leap forward. And when I'm talking about innovations, I'm not talking only about technical innovations. I'm talking about institutional innovations. And this is where, really, you will have an impact to be provided. Think about the institutional innovations. The institutional innovation are, you know, it's an equation where you have technical solutions and political solutions. If you only focus on the technical solutions, and you don't think of the political solutions that will help the technical solutions to be sustainable, then your system will fail. So political solutions need institutional innovation, and this is where your inputs will be extremely important. I didn't talk about regional integration, and apparently it was my subject. So I need to, I need to say a few words about uh, regional integration. Uh, give me just three minutes. When we uh, came out of uh, the colonial era, most of our leaders were in a schizophrenic situation. Remember what uh, Kaveruka was saying this morning? Uh, we said the boundaries, the borders are, shouldn't be reframed. We should stay within our boundaries. But at the same time, we said, like the Nkrumahs and so on, we should think about Pan-African uh, institutions. So it was really schizo schizophrenic, because we adhered to that dogma of not touching the boundaries. And at the same time, the leaders were saying, let's think Pan-African. And if you think Pan-African, well, it's beyond the boundaries. So they accommodated themselves mentally with that schizo schizophrenia during maybe 30 years because they had an objective which was political liberation. And when political liberation was achieved, the schizophrenia started to lower. And then the issue of Pan-Africanism and African unity had an economic content. And regional integration today has fundamentally an economic content. Why? Because we have realized that, listen to me carefully, most of our solutions are not at national level, but at regional level. Whether you talk about education, energy, uh, transport, uh, climate change adaptation, sustainable land management, etc., our solutions are at regional level within regional spaces. The optimality is at regional level. Any, any national solution is 
suboptimal. So that's what is behind the thinking on regional integration. And this is why currently we plan more and more on a regional basis so that the local, the national solutions do fit within regional solutions. In Nepal, we have 16 regional infrastructure projects. I was talking about one of them yesterday. The Lagos-Algiers Highway, uh, four segments, 4,500 kilometers. Who has heard of that? 4,500 kilometers from Algiers to Lagos, and the highway is done. It's just missing about 60 kilometers. And along this highway, you have 700 kilometers of optic fiber already done, and you will have a gas pipeline going from Lagos to Algiers. And this gas pipeline will have connections in order to provide gas to the West Africa region. So regional integration as an economic content and is based on the concept of corridors. And the corridor I'm referring to, in this case, the Algiers-Lagos corridor as an highway, as optic fiber, which will be finalized, and will have a gas pipeline. So Africa, in the next 20 years, will be driven by development corridors. And within these development corridors, we will increase economic density. And then you could have, in that corridor, I was talking about polytechnic institutes training engineers for the maintenance of the highway, and so on, et cetera. So corridors are really the future in terms of regional integration. Lastly, uh, I was very much impressed by all the uh, technological innovations and uh, the ideas that were uh, projected uh, this morning. And in order for them to be sustainable, you have a role to play in influencing the policy design processes so that the states and the role of the state is framed differently. So the role of the state in the years to come will no longer be about setting up regulations all over. It, regulations are necessary, but it will be about liberating energy. And the energy I found this morning uh, has to be liberated. And do not forget, states have a role to play. And you have a role to play in shaping what the states will, are, will be. So uh, on that note, uh, I, I would like to, uh, to, to, to end and uh, uh, refer to uh, you know, a, 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 it's not a, it's not a quote. I, I'm French speaking, so my English is not very good. You will, you will pardon me. Uh, uh, but the, it's the history of, uh, and some of you uh, might, uh, might know it. You know, in initiation processes uh, um, uh, in a pre-Columbian uh, uh, tribe in America, a 12-year-old was being initiated by his grandfather. And his grandfather was telling him, you know, inside of yourself, there are two wolves fighting each other. There is a good one, and there is a bad one. So the, the, young, uh, 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 the young boy asks the grandfather, but at the end of the fight, which wolf is winning? He says, the wolf who is winning, that is winning, is the wolf that you feed. And I sense today that you are feeding the good wolf. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mayaki, for that interesting presentation. Um, we have about 20 minutes now. Uh, 10 minutes. 12 minutes. Okay. <laughs> 12 okay. minutes per Q&A. Maybe I'll start off with one question, and then we can get the audience to ask three or four questions. Um, you spoke about regional integration and, and corridors, uh, mainly focusing on economic integration. But I want to ask 
whether in Africa, and you can specify this on the specific regions, this regional integration is actually driven more from the security agenda than the economic agenda. Um, as we saw in, in, in West Africa recently, yeah. um, we talked about this yesterday as well. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, uh, the, the two regions in the continent w which are making sound progresses in terms of regional integration are the East Africa region and the West Africa region. Uh, the East Africa region has a, an economic agenda which is progressing quite effectively. And if you, just an example, when the heads of states of the East African community meet, their, the first item of their agenda is to look at how the corridor from Burundi to Dar es Salaam is behaving. Uh, uh, is uh, uh, in, in terms of rail, in terms of roads, in terms of optic fiber, in terms of, I mean, medical services, etc. So they have shifted their gear and they are thinking, planning and implementing in terms of corridor. In the case of uh, the West Africa region, you have the Dakar-Lagos corridor, and you have the uh, Kotonu, uh, Niame, Ouagadougou, and then uh, um, Abidjan corridor. So these two corridors are quite well framed, and investments are happening, but not at the same pace as in East Africa. Now, what we do have in, in, uh, in, in West Africa also is this passport. This is a ECOWAS passport. So I can travel from Liberia to Ghana to Burkina Faso to Nigeria with an ID and a passport. So in terms of free movement of people and free movement of goods also, because we have a common external tariff in, in West Africa, it's uh, uh, the, the, regional the economic regional community is building itself. Second point, uh, one of the key elements uh, driving regional integration is the construction of regional markets. Why? Because regional markets are the space where Africa will learn to be competitive. Our learning curve in terms of competitiveness will be within a regional space. And if we construct this regional space, we'll be better armed in order to integrate uh, the world community. So the issue of regional market is extremely important. And I urge you, whatever your projects are, not only to think nationally, but to also think about the regional space and the regional market. Great. On that note, I'll take a couple of questions for people who have questions, so please raise your hand. Uh, one over there, one over there, and Jacob, third one. So we'll start with that one. Good evening. Um, I'm Balato Kweaiko from okay. Sion Spo. Uh, Dr. Mayaki, you talked about how policy is a product of power relations. Uh, so I'd like to ask specifically on France-Afrique relations mm -hmm. and with regards to um, regional to integration. How does France-Afrique influence, does it bolster regional integration or uh -huh. does it work against regional uh, integration? Okay. And how does it influence policy making at a national level within okay. Francophone African countries? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Moj Prenka from the University of Edinburgh. I have a question concerning the EU-AU relationships. So with the um, emphasis on the promotion of good governance within the Cotonou Agreement, what would you like to change post-2020? Okay. Then my, my name is Jacob. Um, from the Latinx, from, uh, turn the mic on. Oh, yeah, my name is Jacob in the MSC Global Governance and Diplomacy and in Nigeria. And my question has to deal with West Africa and the AU as well. Um, looking mainly at peace and security, but in other issues as well, um, there have been times where ECOWAS leadership and AU leadership have been at loggerheads in how they've confronted an issue. So my question is, is that in terms of coordination in a multi-level framework between African regions, how do we fix that? Or are there too many regions? How do we fix the multi-level relationship? Okay. Okay. If we could answer yeah, that, go. then we could okay. also set, get another round of questions right after that. Good. 
Okay, so on the France Afrique issue, free, uh, free, free quick points. Uh, the first one is, as the generation, well, the, the, as the leaders are changing, France Afrique is, go, is being questioned more and more, but it is still present. One of the uh, uh, Point number two, one of the examples of that presence is the, 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 the safer franc, you see. So the, the safer franc, which... which the, the currency for those who are not yeah, familiar. Yeah. The safer franc is the currency uh, for the French-speaking countries in Central Africa and, and West Africa. And the safer franc has a, 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 a fixed parity with the euro, but is guaranteed by deposits within the French Central Bank. And uh, well, this is a, a totally, uh, many of us are saying it today, uh, which is a sign that France Africa doesn't have a power that it had 20, uh, that doesn't have a power today that it had 20 years before. This is a, uh, a, a, a totally uh, colonial uh, 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 management of the monetary field. So that will change. That will but will change in, in the next 10 years maximum. Point number three, uh, the influence of uh, the elites, uh, the Franco-African elites, who had a weight on uh, the policy design processes within the French-speaking countries, is today limited to countries where the democratic intensity is low. So uh, there will need to be an adaptation, and that adaptation will happen unavoidably. And that adaptation will happen because of the internal power relationships in each African country today, in those who are in the zone, the Yuma zone, and the Semak zone. So I, I, I see evidently the end of the France-Afrique dynamics in, in the next 10 years to come. Uh, the other question was about the EU, AU, and the Cotonou Agreement and what needs to be changed. Uh, I think we need to rethink totally the Cotonou Agreement. Some of you might not know what the Cotonou Agreement is. It's a, uh, it, it's a framework of, of cooperation uh, between uh, 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 African countries, between the African Union and the European Union. Why do we need to rethink totally uh, these agreements? Because when they were framed in Cotonou, uh, the conditions that exist today uh, are radically different from the conditions that existed when Cotonou was, was framed. Uh, let me give one, one, uh, one example. Uh, the economic partnerships agreements have been, uh, between the EU and the African Union, have been a source of discord, and Africa doesn't have a common position. So you have individual countries trying to adhere to economic partnership agreement processes, uh, contradicting a regional stance. So the debate is quite intense on the one hand. On the second hand, new issues have come on board, like the migration issue. And uh, when Cotonou was framed, migration was not really an issue, which it is today. So my, uh, my take is that we uh, shouldn't be stuck into a review of a Cotonou agreement. We should rethink about a more global framework of cooperation between the European Union and, and the African Union. Otherwise, we will pursue systems that, well, we'll pursue systems that have been designed but are not being implemented. Uh, thirdly, on the, just to give an example again of the issue of power relationships, uh, uh, the, uh, the economic partnership agreements in West Africa were denounced by the farmers' organizations who were complaining about the fact that they would have, you know, tomato pasta coming from Italy 
and competing what we, what we were producing. And they produced such a pressure that the economic partnership agreement became, uh, the, the heads of states of a region had to uh, go back into their stances in order not to face uh, 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 manifestations, et cetera, et cetera. The last question is on the ECOWAS AU. You are absolutely right. Overlapping of regional economic committees is a problem. But as you know, the African U Union recognizes formally five regional economic communities, even if sometimes we talk about eight, and they do overlap. But fundamentally, uh, we refer to five regional economic communities, and the formal interactions between the African Union Commission and the regional economic communities is at the level of these five. Point number two, uh, uh, we have a unique uh, feature, which is the peace uh, uh, architecture with an early warning system. So the peace architecture as a central body, which is the Peace and Security Council, and as you know, the security, the UN Security Council does not say itself, well, tends to rely on the positions that have been framed within the African Union Peace and Security Council, which itself relies on the peace mechanisms within the region. And this is what happened with Gambia, and this is what happened with Burkina Faso uh, two years ago. So within the peace architecture, there is a coordination mechanism which can allow to lower these contradictions, but I agree that these contradictions do exist. Mm. Perfect. On that note, I'll take one well-crafted question. One last question, uh, and then we're uh, done. <laughs> Sorry, actually, he had raised his hand earlier, so mm -hmm. please, the mic over here. Okay. But it better be a well-crafted question. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, sir. Um, I am from Angola. So in talking about Angola, I want to address SADC. And unfortunately, SADC is not moving forward as the other region in terms of uh, regional uh, integration. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know what's your views and why do you think it's not moving forward? Okay. It's a, it's a tough one. <laughs> uh, uh, well, tough one. Uh, four, four points. Uh, the first one is uh, SADC policies like ECOWAS policies are, uh, you know, uh, very much influenced by the weight of South Africa and in ECOWAS by the weight of Nigeria. It's the reality, given uh, the size of the economies of uh, South Africa and Nigeria within the regions. And uh, the size of the economy has an impact on the regional integration process. Uh, point number two, the uh, SADC has been dealing in the last uh, 10 to 15 years more with political issues than economic issues. Uh, from Zimbabwe uh, to Madagascar, uh, Comoros and so on, it has been really uh, focused on, on more on political issues than on economic issues. Point number three, they made a, a step forward, a very important step forward, by framing an industrialization strategy that South Africa does support. And point number four, as an institution, the, uh, the, the SADC secretariat is maybe the best performing secretariat in terms of, uh, you know, the... Uh, the uh, the, the, the quality of the management systems, etc. So it has an advantage. That advantage has not been fully exploited, but I'm quite confident that with their new industrialization strategy, where they have succeeded in fixing uh, a division of labor on who does what in the region, in a regional industrialization strategy, then SADC will move forward. I, I, I firmly believe so. Mm. Lastly, uh, uh, there also, the, given the dynamism of you know, the civil society groupings, I, I go back again 
to the changing power relationships. In SADC, it is changing quite, quite importantly, and that will have an impact. So maybe you will retain from what I've said that issue of power relationships. Uh, for me, it's very important. Uh, policies are not always rational, and they are very frequently the product of power relationships, and your role is fundamental in that. Thank you very much mm -hmm. on that note. Mm -hmm. Perfect. <laughs> we also have a small speaker's gift. Uh -huh. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. So, almost done. Five minutes. I'll just wrap up. Uh, um, mm, yes. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, just some clo concluding remarks. Uh, we started this journey about seven months ago, eight months ago, with the conference team. Um, and we had our theme already in, in uh, October. And then Donald Trump got elected. And <laughs> we had to go back to the drawing board and, well, realize that this whole thing uh, would have to be framed around the uncertainty that was revolving around us. Um, but we still decided to go with breaking the frameworks. And it would be naive of me now to stand here and come to some grand conclusions about what we learned today. Um, but I guess there's two underlying themes that ran throughout most of the sessions that I'd perhaps like to share to kind of round this off. Um, one is the power of ideas and the power of dialogue. I mean, we talked about power relations, but also just understanding that the politics of idea are, are important. It's, it's perhaps a time to think than act at the moment, because there's so many things that we simply do not understand. Um, and all the debates today came to similar conclusions about the need to rethink our models, rethink how we perceive these things, rethink our methods and how we study these things. So really just Perhaps it's a period of thinking before we act. I'm not saying that apathy is the way and that we shouldn't do, but perhaps we should reconsider some of the things we do. And secondly, um, positionality came up over and over again. Uh, how, I mean, how many of you actually live in Africa at the moment? That's not true. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that says enough, I think, about conferences like these as well, that we should be aware that we are... Um, part of a global elite, about a diaspora, about wanting to be reconnected with our continent. So in, in doing this, we should always be aware of where we come from, where we're going. Um, and I think that's, those are the two things that we saw throughout the sessions today. So on that note, uh, I want to say thank you. Thank you to our sponsors. Thank you to um, our team, obviously, my co-chairs, Vivian and Kin. Where are they? Probably running around. <laughs> there. Uh, there. Please just come. Um, and, and the entire team, uh, Jacob, Gaia, Fiona, and I'm not going to list them all, but you guys know who you are. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, thank you to PSG. Thank you for the staff today. Thank you for helping us out. Um, despite the cancellations, we still hope that everyone had a really, really good time. So thank you. And I really am going to need you to clap a little bit harder because this team, um, the one standing in front of you, um, and Jacob, and everybody who's just been running around for eight months, guys, that's, that's how long it took to kind of really bring all of this together from recruiting the entire team to bring this day um, to happen. And so we're going to need to clap a little bit harder um, for this team. Um, and... And um, Vivian, uh, Ken, Burke, uh, it has been such a pleasure to watch you guys work and to lead your team. And we have been hard on you, and it has been really hard. Um, but we are so, so thankful that you are doing the work that allows us, and this conference is what allows us to keep the Africa Society running, to fund all the activities for the next year, and to make sure that we still have a place like this and a community like this. And so thank you. Thank you.